Attention duped masses! You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Pacific sellout, snortable chocolate, and gluten communion. Plus this day in history with collateral murder and our song of the day by Filthy Friends on Your Morning Monarchy for July 12th, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. Welcome to wherever you are. Good morning. Thank you so much for listening. We are streaming live at MediaMonarchy.com slash listen Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 Pacific time. Your morning monarchy, your pump up the volume, your good news next week, your new world next week. And it is all brought to you by you. Coming to you as always from the peak Portland studios up here in Portland, Oregon. Frank's about to dig in on her breakfast. Hopefully you've had some breakfast and you are safe and sound whenever, wherever you are. If you're in a car, in a cube, in a garden, we are glad that you're here for a little bit of fear-free news. Each day of the week, we focus in on a different area of the news. Monday's world news, Tuesday's technology, Wednesday is food, health, and environment news. That, of course, leaves Thursday for Holy Hexes and Friday for the Entertainment Industrial Complex. We are not only crowdfunded, but we are crowdsourced. Most of our news is brought to you by you on the tweets. And all the stories that we're going to talk about this morning, you can find in the Twitter feed at Media Monarchy, what they call a Twitter moment. Glancing at the lame stream news before we dive into all of it. There, there appears to be some sort of obsession with Russia and America's next top president. I don't know if you guys have caught wind of any of this, but the New York Times and the Bezos Post are really into it. FBI Director Skull and Bones nominee vows independence, says he is not pulling punches. No, we don't know for sure that Christopher Ray is Skull and Bones, but Mnuchin is, and he seems to be in all the press conferences. Holy climate alluvia, one of the biggest icebergs in recorded history just broke loose from Antarctica, so claims the Washington Compost. Morning Joe host Scarborough explains why he's leaving the GOP. Meanwhile, related coverage, Mika Brzezinski lands mega three-book deal. As the fake news continues to grow, I keep waiting for Joe Scarborough to explain why there was a dead intern in his office. Feds Yellen says rate and portfolio plans stay on track. Cautions on inflation. Reddit, Netflix, Google, and dozens of other tech overlords are protesting America's next top president's FCC today. And that's a glance at your breaking lamestream news. Now, when I glance at the breaking lamestream news, it also wants to tell me things about things it thinks I like, like The Simpsons and Morrissey and Portland. So actually, before we dive into our delicious, nutritious Food World Order menu, let's actually glance at a couple of breaking news stories coming here from right in Portland. Arrest warrant issued for Portland activist Micah Rhodes. Here's some of the finest activists here that Peak Portland has to offer. An arrest warrant has been issued for a Portland activist after officials say he violated his release agreement for sex abuse charges. 23-year-old Micah Rhodes. R-H-O-D-E-S, like Cecil, is accused of violating the terms of his release from jail in early June by having contact with a minor. Court records state Rhodes agreed not to have contact with minors when released from jail on February 17th, but a video shows him doing so. Rhodes is accused of sexually abusing two minors in Multnomah County, where I come to you, and Washington County. He is also already a registered sex offender. Rhodes has pleaded not guilty to all charges. He's also pleaded not guilty to a separate misdemeanor theft charge in May where he was stealing from Target. Sticking it to the man. That's how they roll here in Portland, Oregon. Meanwhile, massive, you know, uh, you know, problems that could affect our health, maybe. There is a high risk that a second tunnel filled with radioactive waste might collapse. At the Hanford Nuclear Reservation in Washington State, the U.S. Department of Energy said on dumping day, this is last Friday, so it's pushed down a bit on my breaking lamestream news page. A tunnel partially collapsed, as we reported for you, on May 9th, forcing 3,000 workers to shelter in place for several hours. There were no injuries or release of airborne radiation from that incident? Surely not. The Energy Department said it had completed an evaluation of a second tunnel on the former nuclear weapons production site and determined there is high potential for the 53-year-old structure to collapse. The agency has an August 1st deadline to develop plans to prevent that. So as I've been saying for quite some time, you can put on your little outfits, put on your little costumes, go act like you're sticking it to the man by crushing in some building windows. Meanwhile, we are all about to have some pretty catastrophic health issues. So that's how we begin your morning monarchy for Wednesday, a Food World Order Day. It is July 12th, 2017. Hope your summer is off to a spanking start already. I like transitioning each day into the next 
so that our world news stories on Monday kind of end and go into technology stories and that our technology stories kind of end on Tuesday and go into food, health and environment news. Got a little bit of a leftover from the cyberspace war world. This concept incubator would grow babies in your home in a see-through pod. Who who doesn't want to grow babies in a pod? It's designed to replace the womb and pregnancy, and this video shows a guy having his morning coffee, he comes and puts his hand on the dome, and he's checked in with his baby. The see-through pod sits in your living room. Parents would be able to live their lives normally and go to their job. While your baby gets grown in the matrix, they can watch the fetus grow in the pod while they pour some goop in a cup and has a dock to insert food. (laughs) And there's a microphone that you can speak to the fetus. You can say, did you call the sheriffs? The product is just an idea at this stage. This is just kind of a promotional video of all these goofs looking in the dome. It's like your Robocop being brought back to life, the POV shot. So the question Business Insider asked, is it possible? Yes. Sort of. Healthy lambs have been delivered from a bio bag, and we've reported on that for you recently as well with the pretty weirdo looking photos. The bio bags were never tested with humans previously, but technology is advancing, so it is only a matter of time. Pods like this could replace surrogacy in the future. And the technology could also be used to help premature babies. But then the musical question, of course, is this taking science too far? This concept incubator would be able to grow babies for nine months in your living room. The project, rather the product, is just a concept that was thought up by students at Product Design Arnhem. But in the future, this could be a possibility. Researchers at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia have successfully delivered lambs that have gestated in a bio bag filled with amniotic fluid. The bio bags have never been tested on humans, but as previously noted, the technology is advancing. Cradle to grave, body bag to body bag. Oh, such a brave new world that has such people in it. So that was yesterday's with the robots at work and at play. You could just be a baby plugged into the Matrix. Continuing to look at food, health, and environment news, and that's just that's how we hatch the beginning of this episode. <laughs> Gross. Yeah, what about the animals in your house? They might want a tasty treat out of that pod. However, there is a new way to get local food in Anchorage. And you can place your order online beforehand to get exactly what you want. The Kenai Peninsula Food Hub will debut an Anchorage pilot operation Saturday. Members can purchase food, flowers, handmade goods, and other farmer's market items through a vendor's virtual stall and then pick them up later. Anchorage gets its first food hub, an online farmer's market. Now, you can imagine being fairly separated and distant from people in a place like Alaska. Getting an online food hub together is a good idea. Weekly purchasing opens last Saturday, and they're available for pickup at the Church of Love Spinard. Robin Mixon of Cook Inlet Keeper, a nonprofit that provides administrative support to food hubs, said that after two successful years on the Kenai, the hubs have more than 650 active customers in Seldovia, Homer, and Soldatna the group decided to expand to Anchorage. Alaska has other food hubs, including the Salt and Soil Marketplace in Southeast, but this is the first one in Anchorage. As of last Friday, only two vendors had products available on the site, Jackalof Bay Oysters and Alaska Natural Organics with hydroponically grown greens. But Robbie Mixon said four more will be online soon. She eventually hopes to have about 20 vendors. Anyone can make their first order online, but a $20 annual membership is required for future purchases. Mixon said the membership fee goes towards offsetting the cost of the hub. Mixon said the Anchorage Food Hub will run through at least mid-November. Purchases can be made at anchoragefoodhub.org. What a fantastic idea for other neighborhoods that aren't necessarily that spread out. Efficiency. Gotta love it. Now, what's this negative comment? You know how comment sections are always a really awesome place to learn stuff. Wait, what? 
Why is Cook Inlet Keeper providing admin support to food hubs? Isn't that supposed to be a nonprofit focused on Cook Inlet? Its environment and all the critters in it? What does that have to do with running farmers markets? So you're always going to get the local people arguing with each other, I suppose. Are there not comments about a Portland activist Micah Rhodes? I just I then was like, well, let's hop back and check out some of those comments. Ah, and we just learned this is why it's good to do all this together. It's pronounced keen eye. Like having a keen eye. As we try to on your morning monarchy. Monsanto's corporate behavior has been so counterproductive that it's damaged the reputation of the entire food biotech industry, as has been documented in the book Safe Food, The Politics of Su Food Safety, by Marion, unfortunate last name, Nestle. She runs the food politics blog, and that gives us some of our stories using hashtag food world order, how the GMO industry gets journalists to buy its messages. How about convincing journalists that food biotechnology is the solution to the world's food problems and that any criticism of it is a critique of science in the same category as climate change denial? Journalist Paul Thacker explains that strategy in an article in The Progressive. In recent months, media outlets have reported on a disturbing trend of corporate-sponsored journalism. The British Medical Journal exposed a multi-year campaign by Coca-Cola to influence reporters covering obesity by secretly funding journalism conferences at the University of Colorado. And we reported that for you last year. The watchdog group Health News Review reported that two journalism professors at the University of Kansas asked more than 1,100 healthcare reporters about their views on opioids in a survey that was funded in part by the Center for Practical Bioethics, a group the U.S. Senate Finance Committee investigated for its ties to opioid manufacturers. Hints of the biotech industry's media tactics have leaked from court cases filed against Monsanto alleging glyphosate causes cancer. Several filings reference internal Monsanto documents that describe the company's social media strategy called Let Nothing Go, a program in which individuals who appear to have no connection to the industry rapidly respond to negative social media posts regarding Monsanto, GMOs, and agrochemicals. Another reason the mainline version of the web is pretty much... A Vast wasteland. A wretched hive of scum and villainy. So, Paul Thacker's article describes the fierce industry pushback against anyone who raises questions about food biotechnology. Marion Nestle knows about that pushback firsthand. That's why her site no longer accepts comments anymore, and I believe she just made that change a couple of weeks ago. So, there is the link to that progressive article, How the Biotech Industry Cultivates Positive Media. And this is just one area of the food world order, if you will. Take that out to the cyberspace war world, or the holy hexes world, or the geopolitics world, or the media memes world. They're all going to do it in their various little job fields. So we think about this in food, which just seems somewhat simple and silly. So much more important when you're talking about war and murder and death, right? Possibly, yes. That's food politics. And that's how, for the most part, your media is bought and paid for, and that's why people are turning it off in droves. Now, we talked yesterday about how CNN, with the help of their friends at Apple, deleted the CNN News app out of the store to get rid of all those single stars and all those terrible reviews. They let them re-upload it and it erased all the bad reviews, but uh, guess what? I just saw this morning they're back to one star again. That's probably not going to be uh, as simple as they think, because pretty much the rules have changed. You are listening to The Morning Monarchy for Wednesday, July 12th, 2017, and I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. We've talked a lot on these shows, not only about the Kennedys. I saw a great tweet yesterday that noted, America's, we're, we're not a family dynasty where you can have all these members with the Trumps and Melania and Ivanka sitting in for dad at G20. We're not a we're not a monarchy. And below it's just a picture of Teddy, Jack, and Bobby. The Camelot dynasty. Yes, we are a country of dynasties. Lest we forget the first couple of presidents were all related to each other. The Adams boys, anyone? So we've talked about Robert F. Kennedy Jr. quite a bit on these archives. And again, we've been online since 
September 11th, 2005. And there's a lot of articles on MediaMonarchy.com. And there's a lot of articles discussing vaccines. And we are hardly anti-vaccine. Just like Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is hardly anti-vaccine. Now, new establishment tool, and uh, Americans love nothing better than having a finger wagged at them from some snooty-ass Brit like Piers Morgan, or, in this case, John Oliver. So Robert F. Kennedy Jr. makes an appearance on Tucker Carlson to reply to Mr. John Oliver when it comes to vaccines. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is spending years campaigning for safer vaccines in the United States. Recently, that campaign provoked some savage ridicule from HBO host John Oliver. Watch. These days, very few people will say they are completely anti-vaccine. Instead, like the president, they'll say, I'm not anti-vaccine, but. One example is, hey, I'm not anti-vaccine, but I am pro-safe vaccine. And, and that can often refer to concern over scary-sounding ingredients like thimerosal, a, a mercury-based preservative. For years now, RFK Jr. has led a crusade against it. In fact, just this year, he gave a speech where he said this. For 33 years, I've been working to get mercury out of fish. Nobody has ever called me any fish. And because I want mercury out of vaccines, I should not be called any vaccine. Okay, well, for a start, why would anyone be ashamed to be called anti-fish? Fish are stupid. And how do I know that? Look at them. Just look at this idiot. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. joins us tonight. The response to that piece that John Oliver did really struck me. I think of you as someone whose bona fides as a Democrat and a liberal are kind of unimpeachable, and yet they piled on you. Why? Why is raising questions about the safety of vaccines a no-go zone on the left? Well, you know, it's interesting because it, it's not consistent with the traditional liberal posture of skepticism towards large corporate power and particularly the pharmaceutical industry yes. and, and government agencies. And, and CDC has been characterized by at least four federal studies as a cesspool of corruption because of its pervasive um, interactions, entanglements, I would say with the vaccine industry. CDC, the CDC vaccine branch has really is really a subsidiary of the vaccine industry. It sells $4.1 billion worth of vaccines a year. It spends about $4.6 billion, almost half of its budget, promoting vaccines, and it only spends $20 million testing vaccines. That's good for a tiny handful of the vaccines we have. One of the problems, and you know, I've been meeting recently with the heads of various federal agencies, and one of the you know, one of the kind of shocking things about vaccines is that there's very little safety testing. If you have a normal drug, let's say Vioxx or Viagra, um, if you want to bring that to market, typically FDA requires you to do double blind placebo studies. So you take 9,000 people, give them the pill, 9,000 people, and give them a pill that's identical except it's just sugar. And then you look, you watch typically for around five years and see if there's harm. Yes. Uh, with vaccines, all of those requirements are waived. I don't know what to think of that. I, I have many children. I had them all vaccinated. I'm not against vaccines. But I am for asking sincere questions. And I suspect... Exactly. I, I'm deeply suspicious of people who shout down those questions on the basis of the fact they're unfashionable. So I still don't understand why all of a sudden you're not allowed to ask sincere questions. I don't think you're getting paid for this, are you? No, I'm not. In fact, I'm getting unpaid for this. It's been probably the worst career move that I've ever made. But, and, but you know, this is, um, it's deeply concerning to me because if you look at the vaccine schedule, the vaccine schedule was um, it expanded dramatically in 1989. In 1987, Congress passed a law giving blanket immunity from liability to vaccine manufacturers. So suddenly vaccines became pay dirt. There was a gold rush to put new vaccines on the schedule. I got three vaccines when I was a kid and I was fully compliant. 
My children got 69 vaccines. Today's children got 74 vaccines, 74 shots of 16 vaccines. So, and nobody has ever tested all of what all those vaccines do together. And in fact, many of the vaccines have not been tested at all for the illnesses that are associated with them. I don't know what the answer is, but I know what the questions ought to be, and you always have a place in the show to ask them. Any, anyone with sincere but questions. You know, it's Dr. Thank you. That is very kind and courageous of you because, as you know, most television hosts will not let you on to talk about this issue. On the evening news, typically 17 out of 24 advertisements are pharmaceutical advertisements, and most hosts are frightened of that. So I am very grateful to you I don't think we ought to be afraid of honest questions, and I think you're, you're asking them. Thank you for coming on. I appreciate Thank it. you, Tucker. That's Robert F. Kennedy Jr. on Tucker Carlson. And it's interesting, as of course, as the pendulum swings back and forth, and one party's in favor and one party's out of favor, and one news channel's doing really well, and the other is just a laughing stock. It's interesting to watch one host rise and become, oh, wow, it seems like Tucker Carlson's one of the few shows where people can go on and speak about controversial issues. Now, it's also worth noting, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has what is called spasmodic dysphonia, a voice disorder characterized by involuntary movements or spasms of one or more muscles of the larynx during speech. Spasmodic dysphonia is a neurological disorder rather than a disorder of the larynx or the muscles. It is very rare, affecting an estimated 0.02% of the population and is twice as common in women than in men. That is why RFK Jr. sounds like he's struggling to speak. Because in a lot of ways, he is. You are listening to The Morning Monarchy for Wednesday, July 12th, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com, and we're talking about the fake left's view on vaccine is not the typical fake left anti-corporation policy. I, I think we can note that that's been thrown away. If there was no other mission accomplished during the eight years of Obama, it was getting the fake left to finally and fully tear down and throw down their anti-war signs. Let's continue to look at food, health, and environment news using hashtag food world order. In an expression of profound disappointment, the nation's most aggressive organic industry watchdog, Cornucopia Institute, sent a letter to the USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue criticizing the department's rejection of guidance from its expert advisory panel. The National Organic Standards Board recommended discontinuing the use of conventional inulin oligofructose-enriched IOF whey protein concentrate, and Turkish bay leaves in organic products. The NOSB found that all three of those things are no longer essential for use in organic food production. However, after pressure from organic and agribusiness lobbyists, political appointees overruled the board to leave these ingredients on the USDA's national list of substances allowed for the use in organics for the next five years. Quote, this is highly disrespectful to all engaged industry participants. Material decisions by the NOSB are based on a collaboration with all organic stakeholders over a period of a year. In this case, after receiving written and oral public testimony, the board voted 14 to zip to delist the three substances in question in an effort to prod organic manufacturers to use available certified organic ingredients. Even the board chair, Tom Chapman, who works for Cliff Bar, who have recently had a big, huge recall of Cliff Bars, a company that currently uses non-organic whey protein concentrate in their products, voted for the delisting based on what he said was a sufficient supply of organic whey. Now, this is a long story. But what it goes into is Trump and Purdue are not draining the swamp at the USDA. It is more cronies coming in. And from what I can tell, much like Sonny Perdue, a lot of it seems to be coming out of Georgia. Of course, that's where the Centers for Disease Creation is. That's where it's based. That's where Coke is. That's where CNN is. So the fix is in. Or as just noted from the chat, from the dirt. Organic is a click at this point. A clique. Or maybe like a big club and you ain't in it. Now, last year on Your Morning Monarchy, it seemed really easy to almost have a sellout of the week nearly every week. Now, I suppose we could probably continue to do that if we were able to keep track of it a little bit more. I'd love your help in tracking companies that sell out. Pretty simple. 
smaller companies that willingly let themselves be sucked up into the giant corporate mall, thereby making people like me question their whole move in the first place. Campbell Soup has made its fifth acquisition in as many years with the purchase of an Oregon-based producer of organic broth and soup. Campbell Soup has acquired Pacific Foods for, I think, a steal of $700 million in cash, the soup company announced last Thursday. Pacific Foods, founded in 1987, produces organic broth and soup and shelf-stable plant-based beverages, meals, and sides. The company's generated about $218 million in net sales as of May 31st just this year, according to Campbell's. Pacific Foods has about 540 employees with a plant in Tualatin, Oregon, where it was founded. Campbell's will continue to operate the company from Tualatin. Pacific Foods will become a part of Campbell's America's Simple Meals and Beverages, all capitalized division, led by President Mark Alexander. This division includes brands like V8, Swanson, Prego, Pace, and Plum Organics, another organic sellout who, just after they sell out, seem to have whoops recall problems. Shocker. This recent acquisition, that's mergers and acquisitions, or murders and executions, if you like American Psycho, follows the company's growth and penetration in the health-focused segment of the food and beverage industry. They realized they had their lunch eaten, so to speak, and that's why they're buying up the organic companies. Because, I don't know if you guys have heard this or not, people are kind of maybe into worrying about what they put in their bodies now, once they found out it was all a bunch of poison. Formerly called Packaged Fresh. Campbell's Sea Fresh division is spearheaded by Bolt House Farms, which the company also acquired in 2012 for $1.55 billion. Campbell's then acquired Plum Organics in 2013 and then Garden Fresh Gourmet, a Ferndale, Michigan-based salsa maker, for $231 million in 2015. Beyond the acquisitions, Campbell's has also made major investments in other companies. Campbell's in February 2016 announced a $125 million venture fund for food and food-related companies, with a link. Campbell's in May of this year made a $10 million investment in Sheft, that's C-H-E-F apostrophe D, a California-based e-commerce meal marketplace to boost its e-commerce capabilities, because you have to do everything for everyone. You must constantly grow, you know, because your board members will get mad if you don't. Campbell's in October 2016 invested $32 million in San Francisco-based Habit, a personalized nutrition company, and Campbell supports the Soulful Project, a startup within a large company founded by four Campbell's employees. These investments in and acquisitions of health-focused foods, including Pacific Foods, position Campbell's well in the future as consumer demands and taste shifts. Campbell's Soup, a name that we don't talk about very often here, but Campbell making a strategic acquisition today. Those shares are up a half a percent. It is buying privately held organic soup maker Pacific Foods for $700 million. Yeah, and uh, yesterday we talked about General Electric, a large cap dividend paying stock that's been showing very sluggish price performance. I think it was J.P. Morgan yesterday that didn't have very good comments about uh, GE. Right. Campbell Soup is actually in a, in a similar, it's an entirely different company than GE, but just a large liquid large cap name with uh, with that pays a nice dividend yield, just mm-hmm. like um, just like uh, GE. However, uh, it's showing very similar price action. It's just been a terrible price performer. So, income investors need to be careful. I'm writing the income column today, you know, for, for <laughs> IBD Weekly, so I'm just going to... Is this in there? Uh, <laughs> it, it's not, but it, it actually is up, uh, up, towards the, uh, up towards the top, but, you know, when you're looking for a good dividend-paying stock, you have to demand yeah. good price performance as well. You know, a stock that's, you know, 20, 30, 40% off its high, it's getting hit hard by institutional selling that, that has a good dividend yield, that really doesn't matter much because of the, the, the mm-hmm. money that you're losing on the stock exactly. itself. So, relative price strength, um, you know, good dividend yield, good fundamentals. Yes. I'm writing about a company today uh, for IBD Weekly that just fits all those parameters and uh, seems to have pretty good potential. So so let me break down the economic talk and let you know that now Pacific Foods is one more brand to add to the boycott list. You've probably seen Pacific on your shelf. They make the little, the, they make the soup boxes in what are called the aseptic containers, little rectangular little soup bricks. Now, one of the thousands of fantastic things I've learned from the amazing Cassie Cohn, my life partner, love of my life, and my wife, she's taught me a lot about food. 
between her and the grocery store, New Seasons, that I worked for from 2006 to 2000, 2012. That was a huge, gigantic food education for me in a lot of ways. At the grocery store, I saw it on the shelf. I got to see food inflation happen. I got to see the sellout companies happen. I got to see them shrink the amount of ounces in a product because they know you would never notice that that went down from 5 ounces to 4.5 ounces, but they figure you would probably notice if they jacked up their price. So they decided to shrink all the products. So in the last decade, there has been a lot of shrinkflation and not a lot of people notice it on the shelf. Now, the main thing that I've learned from Cassie and something we constantly do here at the house, it pretty much overloads our freezer. I wish we had a bigger freezer and refrigerator. We make broth, as our buddy Head just noted in the chat. Canned soup is ridiculous. Sorry, I was going to misquote it. Head in a jar says, quote, canned soup is trash. So here's the deal. When you're making more food for yourself at home, which you should be doing more of anyway, you save all those bits. You save the carrot tops. You save the butts. You save the pieces. You save all of those things in a freezer bag. Then we take all those when it's big, when it's full, put them in a pot, put filtered water in it, and boil it. Then you strain all that off, and then you've got broth, homemade broth that you made. And then depending on whatever foods that you're making, maybe you had a chicken, maybe you've got some carcass, maybe you've got some other kind of meat goodness. You can make all kinds of different broths. Now, our buddy Chef Jake is actually just moving, and he's now pretty much neighbors to one of our other media monarchy friends, our buddy Matt, up in Idaho of Convince Yourself Media. They were even just joking in the chat about, hey, man, we're, we're like neighbors now. We're going to start to make a food show. I would love to make food shows in the media monarchy kingdom. They would pretty much have to star Cassie. I'm James Evan Pilato, your host, webmaster, DJ, and so very much more from the mighty MediaMonarchy.com kingdom, serving up your morning monarchy live via MediaMonarchy.com slash listen, and it is a hump day. That means food, health, and environment news, and I swear we've discussed this story on New World next week before, but we might have to discuss it a little bit more when we tape the latest episode a little bit later today. The Oregon legislature passed two bills last Thursday decriminalizing small amounts of six hard drugs, including coke, heroin, meth, and ecstasy. The first of the two bills now headed to Governor Kate Brown's desk, HB 2355, decriminalizes possession of the drugs so long as the offender has neither a felony nor more than two prior drug convictions on record, according to the Lund Report. The LundReport.org. The second, HB 3078, reduces drug related property crimes from felonies to misdemeanors. Republican State Senator Jackie Winters claimed the war on drugs as it currently exists amounts to institutional racism due to how frequently, how more frequently minorities are charged with drug crimes than whites. There is empirical evidence that there are certain things that follow race. We don't like to look at the disparity in our prison system, Winter said during a hearing. It is institutional racism. We can pretend it doesn't exist, but it does. The second bill reduces mandatory minimum sentences for many property crimes and also increases the number of previous convictions necessary for a felony charge. It provides $7 million in funding for diversion programs to help divert the fact that this state is falling apart. Uh, that's not what that says. Diversion programs to help lower Oregon's prison population. Oh, okay. Winters and other supporters of the bill argue the answer to America's drug crisis is treatment, not prison time. It would be like putting them in the state penitentiary for having diabetes. Democratic Representative Mitch Greenlick told the Lund Report, this is a chronic brain disorder and it needs to be treated this way. Now, I call me crazy, but I may have a little bit of misgivings about reducing drug-related property crimes from felonies to misdemeanors. So are you saying when drugged out freaks come and rob my shit that that's not a felony anymore? That's just a misdemeanor? Because, you know, they're just robbing and stealing and trying to kill you to, you know, help their brain, right? A lot of craziness going on in the world, and that's a lot of the reasons why we're pretty excited to get out of peak Portland. I asked an interesting question that got a lot of replies and got a lot of questions back at me that I asked on Twitter last night. Hey, does anybody have a pepper spray or stun gun that they can recommend, that they can personally vouch for? It was only a couple of seconds before our buddy James Corbin was like, whoa, that's not the kind of question I like to see you guys tweeting out. Things getting rough there in peak Portland, and indeed they are. Now, you guys know I follow the 
crime logs and I follow PDX alerts on Twitter and PDX police log or Portland police log, whatever it is. I can see the crime getting closer. It used to always be, oh, that crazy crime. Oh, that's happening out on 82nd. Oh, that's out on 115th. Now it's not. It's at 10th. Much closer. Then you can look outside. I mean, what? it was only a week or two ago that we were just starting the show, and I could hear raving derelicts outside. And I even said, I was like, oh, it's, that's another Portland morning of crazy people screaming outside. And indeed it was. Now, something I forgot to mention yesterday that I will mention right now, and I'll remind you again towards the end of this episode. We do have the latest episode of Good News next week. It's episode 53. Cheers! There's new probiotic beer. And among some of the other ways that we are winning in solutions-oriented stories, we talk about that, is Nevada. There's a reefer shortage in Nevada. After just one week of recreational marijuana sales, supplies are drying up. The governor has approved an emergency regulation to ease licensing to keep the new industry puffing along. When Nevada voters approved commercial sales of weed to adults over 21 in a November ballot measure, the joke was that buffets would soon be emptied. Ha ha ha. Instead... Just one week after the law went into effect July 1st, the marijuana dispensaries are the ones unable to keep up with the customer demand. Less than two weeks after sales kicked off of recreational marijuana, Nevada is now making an emergency regulation because there's not enough pot. Stores in Nevada running out due to unanticipated demand. The regulation will allow more dispensaries to become licensed distributors, including liquor wholesalers. Ah, well, there we go. That's the answer. And that's generally why whenever you see a state say, we've declared a state of emergency, what they're saying is, we change the rules so that more money can start to flow towards us. Aha. Governor Brian Sandoval declared a state of emergency on Friday to expand what kind of applicants can be approved to do the job. The department is set to adopt the licensing rule changes as soon as Thursday, tomorrow, July 13th. Lack of weed prompts state of emergency in Nevada. Now, they speculate that Nevada is actually going to beat Colorado and Washington and Oregon for sales because of Las Vegas and the massive, massive tourism industry there. And we've said it before, I really, really hate the fact that the same people who lorded over the prohibition of cannabis are the same ones that get to lord over the exploitation of cannabis. And it is quite literally a gold rush, and everybody's getting in right now. There's going to be a lot of people that get in just for the, for the buck. And fortunately, there are a lot of people that aren't in it just for the buck. They're in it for their life. And those are the people, fortunately, that are going to keep cannabis safe for all of us. But perhaps you you don't like smoking. Maybe you like, you know, snorting chocolate. U.S. Senator Chucky Schumer, Amy's uncle, is urging federal regulators to won't somebody please think of the children and look into snortable chocolate powder, saying he's worried it could prove harmful and is being marketed like a drug. A controversial powder that just hit the markets last month is facing a possible crackdown. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer is calling for the Federal Drug Administration to look into snortable chocolate. Yeah, you heard her right. Uh, One brand, Coco Loco, is advertised as a drug-free way to get a quick buzz, but there are growing health concerns over this product. As you can imagine, Mm -hmm. CBS News medical contributor Dr. Tara Narula is here to discuss the potential health risks of Coco Loco. I, I gotta say, just when I heard about it, it just seems odd it and not that loco. much fun at all. <laughs> it sounds loco. It sounds loco. Yes. Yeah, totally. Um, so this trend started in Europe. Right. And then it moved over here. Right. So the man who owns the company yeah. basically said that he had seen this being popularized in Europe over the past two years, being used there, hadn't heard of any possible side effects or problems and decided to create the product here and market it in this country. And what is it being used for? So it's being used to give a feeling of euphoria, a feeling of ecstasy, a quick high that lasts about what they say is 30 to 60 minutes. Obviously there are concerns. Well, yeah, Uh, anytime you snort something. (laughs) Anytime you're putting something up your nose. Yes. Yes, there is a concern. It seems like an odd way to get something into your system. Absolutely. Especially chocolate, which is fun enough on its own when you just sort of ingest it the regular (laughs) way, don't you think? Well, the problem is it's not only the caffeine, you know, in the in the cocoa, but essentially also there are other ingredients that they're putting in this ginkgo biloba, gorine, taurine. um, And we don't know how much you're absorbing or getting into your system with each snort. 
you know, how many snorts you're doing. Obviously, you're yeah. increasing the dose. Right. Uh, Obviously, I think of cocaine um, when I think of snorting anything. And Chuck right. Schumer, the senator, actually compared this to cocaine. Right. Um, should one training think wheels. of it? Is, it, it, training is, wheels. is right. it that? Is it a gateway, potentially? I mean, certainly it could be. I yeah. think the scary thing is, is that, you know, in many ways it's marketed towards kids and yeah. adolescents who may think that this is safe because it's chocolate, it's natural. But, you know, anytime you're putting anything up your nose, you're increasing your risk for inhalation into the lungs, which can, you know, worsen airway disease, yeah. asthma, respiratory problems, lead to pneumonia. You're obviously irritating the lining of the nose, which can increase risk of infections, bleeding, sinusitis or sinus problems, risk for decreased loss of smell. So, I mean, this isn't something without potential risk for complications. Now, you mentioned uh, a lot of the ingredients are also found in energy drinks. Right. Is it energy, energy drinks, huge market. Mm -hmm. People are familiar with these ingredients. They're ingesting it at least in a drink mm -hmm. form. Then can we extrapolate from that that it can't be that bad because we're, it's stuff that's already on the market? Well, the problem with the stuff that's already on the market yeah. is that these are considered supplements, right? So they're not regulated by the FDA. And so in this class of supplements, it's only after something's on the market right. that if red flags start to be raised that there's an investigation launch. So there are many products out there that have the potential for risk. And so certainly, you know, these with the ingredients that could be stimulants that could lead to palpitations, insomnia, anxiety, arrhythmias, other problems, that risk is there. Let's say we were going to give this company, which is called Legal Lean, the benefit of the doubt here. They boast that Coco Loco bears benefits with endorphins and serotonin, which are hormones, chemicals. Um, how do their claims hold up? I'm not sure how they're making these claims. I mean, this has really never been studied. It's yeah. not something that's been researched. It's not something that we know how it affects the body uh, biologically. So there's really no way to kind of back up those claims scientifically. Tara, like I said before. Yeah. Chocolate is so much fun <laughs> in a bar, in Eaten. hot chocolate. Yes. Yeah, there's so many ways to enjoy chocolate. Mm, I, I don't want to sound flip one. about this, but mm. what are... Wh how do you ingest the cal I mean, what I think of as calories when you ingest chocolate. Is that one of the potential benefits of, of eating chocolate or consuming it this way? Getting your chocolate fix getting without your getting without calories. the calories? I mean, I guess I'm you can look at it that way, but no. I mean, please, I think people need to be careful and cautious and wary of yeah. this, for sure. Dr. Tara Narula, thank you so much for joining <laughs> thank us. Thank you. Oh, my God. I, I just love hearing the funny dinosaurs in newsrooms. Your shit is wrapping up rapidly. And I can tell you, I've kind of worked in that world before. <laughs> so there's a lot, of, a lot of things to talk about on this. I actually looked at Coco Loco on Amazon last night while we were prepping this story for today's show. Legal Lean, which sells Coco Loco online for $19.99 for a 1.25 ounce tin, did not return a call seeking comment from the New York Daily News. Founder Nick Anderson has said he didn't consult any medical professionals but believes Coco Loco is safe. That sounds about as good as the assurances we have about vaccines, doesn't it? He said he developed it from snortable chocolate that's circulated in Europe for recent years. Now, this is fantastic advertising. Now, here's the investment tip. I am not a lawyer and I'm not providing legal advice, but I would recommend you buy the shit out of this on Amazon right now because you know they're going to ban it. You know the moral panic is going to be huge. I mean, honestly, it's the moral panic that makes me want to try it and makes me want to do it. It's going to be like Four loco. Oh my God, we can't have these things in the market. What about the children? Can you find any evidence whatsoever that this Coco Loco is being marketed towards children? There's just a lot of BS going off in this story. As there seems to be nearly every week on your food, health, and environment news. Last couple of stories on your Food World Order edition of your Morning Monarchy. A restoration project at a New Jersey museum unearthed cases of wine nearly as old as as Trollmerica itself, the Liberty Hall Museum in Union, said it discovered almost three cases, three full cases, of Madeira wine, a fortified wine, dating to 1796 while restoring its wine cellar. NJ.com reports the museum also found 42 demijons, large glass jugs sometimes used for holding spirits, dating to the 1820s. The museum said the monetary value of the wine cannot be made public, so don't even ask. Meanwhile... Mashed potatoes in Utah tell that wine to hold its beer. Out of the ordinary archaeological finds never fail to fascinate as we dig into the past, like the prehistoric potato granules unearthed in Utah, which experts say could be up to 10,900 years old. To be more precise, these are starch granules from the Solanum jamasee, 
Jamesy plants, which produces small wild potatoes, and they could make us they could help us make the potatoes of today more resistant to drought and disease. That sounds like a great idea. On top of that, this looks to be the first example of a domesticated potato plant, one made safe to eat, appearing in North America, giving historians new insight into the diets and cooking methods used by our ancient ancestors. 10,900-year-old mashed potatoes found in Utah by archaeologists. And as long as you're talking about old classic stuff... An Amish man was sentenced Friday to six years in prison for obstructing a federal agency and for making and selling herbal health products that were not adequately labeled as required by law. Samuel A. Girod, G-I-R-O-D, of Bath County, a member of the Old Order Amish faith, was convicted in March on 13 charges, including threatening a person in an attempt to stop him from providing information to a grand jury. Well, that'll get you jury tampering. U.S. District Judge Danny Reeves repeatedly asked Gerard in court if he wished to make a statement, but Gerard refused. Gerard, who represented himself, which I always love, does not acknowledge that the court has jurisdiction. I do not waive my immunity to this court. I do not consent. He sold herbal health products and is going to prison for six years. There is a moral panic about snortable chocolate that no one would have heard about unless all the lamestream news talked about snortable chocolate. Meanwhile, the weapons of war that were built decades ago are festering right beneath me. And they're shooting up your kids with poisons. Let's just have a little bit of perspective here. Last story on your Food World Order segues us perfectly into tomorrow's Holy Hexes news as Pope Frank has weighed in on the matter of religious bread making by reminding his flock that the body of Christ is not gluten free. In a letter circulated to Roman Catholic bishops, Cardinal Robert Sarah of the Congregation for Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments was instructed by Pope Frank to tell church members about the correct ingredients of the bread and wine given to Mass celebrants, the body of Christ. Because, you know, it's not crazy at all to sort of have a cannibalistic religion where you eat your Savior. <laughs> mm. And, of course, Chocolate Bunny left eggs in the night. The body of Christ, the blessed bread given to Catholics, must contain a small amount of gluten, according to the Vatican, while the wine must be made from unsoured grapes. So there you have it. Vatican rules the body of Christ can't be gluten-free, so you have to have a gluten communion. Ah, the good news, the body of Christ can be GMO. That is the shocking and delicious and nutritious Food World Order menu for you. And again, I want to remind you, Latest episode of Good News Next Week has been published. Cheers! There's new probiotic beer. It also includes stories about our friend Justin, who is running a site called NatureBay.com, and he is fighting a little company called eBay. We're going to wrap up with brand new music from a band that calls themselves Filthy Friends, and it features Janet Weiss and Corin Tucker from a little band called Slater Kinney, and it also features... The guy who came to visit Portland and I think stayed for a long time, Peter Buck, formerly of R.E.M. They've got a super group called Filthy Friends, and we have got a short, sharp rocker for you to wrap up this episode from Filthy Friends. But first, let's take a filthy look at this day in history. Past is prologue. July 12, 1804. Former United States Secretary of the Treasury Alexander Hamilton dies one day after being shot in a duel by Aaron Burr. July 12, 1917, the Bisbee deportation occurs as vigilantes kidnap and deport nearly 1,300 striking miners and others from Bisbee, Arizona, the home of the great Doug Stanhope. July 12, 1948, Israeli Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion orders the expulsion of Palestinians from the towns of Lod and Ramla. And on July 12, 1962, the Rolling Stones perform their very first concert on this day, July 12, 1962, at London's Marquee Club. 1965, the Beach Boys released California Girls. And on July 12, 1967, race riots begin on this day in Newark, New Jersey. Then we jump to the rockin' 90s, July 12, 1992. Axel Rose was arrested at New York's JFK Airport on a warrant from St. Louis, Missouri. Rose was wanted on charges stemming from a 1991 Guns N' Roses concert that pretty much ended in a riot. Now, is that the same one where James Hetfield was burned by the pyrotechnics, so then Metallica leaves, and then Guns N' Roses never came on, and everybody wrecked the joint? 
Rock and roll used to feel kind of crazy and dangerous. <laughs> I don't know if you remember this. July 12th, 1996, Jonathan Melvoin, who was the touring keyboardist with Smashing Pumpkins, was found dead in New York City hotel room of a heroin overdose. The band went into damage control mode and fired their founding drummer, Jimmy Chamberlain. 1999, July 12th, DMX is arrested in Trinidad in mid-concert for using obscene language. That very same day, July 12th, 1999, Fred fucking Durst was arrested in St. Paul, Minnesota for allegedly kicking a local security guard in the head during the band's performance. Now, Monday this week, our This Day in History focus story was the launch of Telstar. Yesterday's this Day in History focus was Skylab 79 breaking up in the atmosphere, and I like the idea that each day this week we could have something from the skies. And this day I do have it for you, but not exactly like I thought it would be. It is death from above indeed. July 12th, 2007, a decade ago today, U.S. Army Apache helicopters perform airstrikes in Baghdad, Iraq. Footage from the cockpit is later leaked to the internet by Bradley, a.k.a. Chelsea Manning, and it is called Collateral Murder. So it's been three years since WikiLeaks released a graphic video dubbed the Collateral Murder, showing U.S. helicopters slaying over a dozen Iraqi civilians. The incident shocked the world and also left a mark on many American soldiers who witnessed the massacre. And one of them has exclusively spoken to RT. Revisiting the tragic day, he says, destroyed his life. It was the video that put WikiLeaks on the map, turned the tide of war in Iraq, and landed Private First Class Bradley Manning in military detention. But for Army veteran Ethan McCord, it was just another day on duty. The helicopters, they're approximately about a mile and a half away um, when they were zooming in on these guys. And uh, from looking at it now, you can't see anything. I mean, that right there is obviously a camera dangling if you were to really pay attention. Um, that guy has an AK-47 right there. Baghdad, Iraq. 2007, the 216th Battalion was out patrolling a volatile part of the city. I was about five blocks away, four or five blocks away to the, uh, to the left of the screen. It, this was a battalion-wide mission. And then the situation turned deadly. Come on, fire. We heard the Apaches firing. Ethan and his infantry squad began running toward the scene to provide support. Again, the Apache helicopter opened fire. Come on. When he arrived on the scene, the Apache guns were quiet. The accused enemies were dead. I just drove over a body. <laughs> yeah. One guy's head, was com the top of his head was completely off and his brains were, were on the ground. And, and the smell, the smell still haunts me today. It, I don't even know how to describe it. When he approached the van, a noise Ethan wasn't expecting, a cry of a little girl. I think she was four years old, and um, you could tell she had a wound to the stomach. And uh, I remember her looking at me, and, and the blood around her eyes made her eyes so ghostly white. Ethan grabbed the girl and ran into a nearby building. He then picked glass out of her eyes so she could blink and handed her off to a medic. I went back outside and um, was told to take pictures. So I started taking pictures of the inside of the van. And that's when he discovered the little boy. And that's me. What's in your eyes? That is a little boy um, who I originally thought was dead. Despite their injuries, the children survived. But part of Ethan changed forever that day. But I couldn't stop myself from crying. I couldn't stop myself from feeling the way that I was feeling. When he did seek mental help, he says he was mocked by his commanders and threatened with expulsion from the military. That's when I started drinking. Um, mental health had given me prescriptions, 13 prescriptions um, of Geodon, uh, Depakote, uh, Prozac. I mean, I was, I was a zombie. And he would go on to describe having fantasies of murdering his own family. Yeah, murder will have that effect. Now, interestingly enough, it seems like Chelsea Manning would describe these events now with uh, just a series of emojis. Ten years ago today, collateral murder. 
with a blank check given by 9-11. You want to be anti-war? You want to be pro-environment? You want to stop Trump? It's all in 9-11 truth. Been saying it for nearly 16 years. Published to my own website a decade ago today. Joe Lieberman says U.S. will back Israeli strike on Iran. Military analyst says the West needs more terror in order to save their failing, flailing foreign policy. That, interestingly enough, was posted by Paul Joseph Watson, who I doubt feels that same way anymore. New York City firefighters douse Giuliani's 9-11 urban legend and former First Lady Lady Bird Johnson. Those four stories published to MediaMonarchy.com a decade ago today. As the collateral murder events were unfolding, we would only learn about them later and get the videos later. Interesting list of birthdays. July 12th, Henry David Thoreau, George Eastman, famed director Todd Browning. Yeah, he made Dracula, but he also made Freaks. Louis B. Mayer's birthday. Amadeo Modigliani, Italian painter and sculptor. It's also Gene Hersholt's birthday. Buckminster Fuller, Oscar Hammerstein II, Milton Burrow, Andrew Wyeth, Van Cliburn, Bill fucking Cosby celebrating his birthday today. Robert McFarlane, Christine McVie, our buddy Lauren Coleman of CopycatEffect.com celebrating a birthday today. He turns 70. It's also Richard Simmons' birthday. Late great Kiss drummer Eric Carr born on this day. Brian Grazer. Cheryl Ladd, the late, great Charlie Murphy, Robin Wilson from the Gin Blossoms, and Topher Grace. I don't know that any of those folks will weasel their way into our daily DJ set at noon. Your Wednesday hump up the volume tends to be a little more twangy, a little more earthy style, fitting in with our food, health, and environment news. But we will wrap up this morning monarchy with Filthy Friends, supergroup of R.E.M. and Slater Kenny. Holy moly. The Arrival is the song from The Invitation, the album that's coming out on Kill Rockstars. The Arrival from Filthy Friends wraps up this episode. And again, we are glad you're here. We are glad you take part in Fear Free News. I'm not the greatest. I'm not the best at this by any stretch. I'm a kid from West Virginia who loves to pay attention and loves to share ideas and information and news and media. I always have. I've told you the joke before. It was written on my Sunday school report. Jim thinks he's whispering. Yeah, I don't want to whisper. I want to scream it loud and talk to everybody and hopefully do it in a fear-free way that can kind of bring us together. We talk about bad stuff, but it's not all bad. We are learning our way forward. And that's the Wednesday Food World Order edition of Your Morning Monarchy brought to you by you. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com again thanking you so much for listening and reminding you, as always, like Jello Biafra said, don't hate the media, become the media. Take care. <laughs> You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology and the occult, all remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.